Yeah, uh, I think we should make a start. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and I, I'm not sure what to expect from this talk. This we've got an, an anthology series. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our new director of Sussex Neuroscience. Um, and do we know that people can hear us at home? Yes. Did you get some confirmation on that? Okay, cool. Uh, right. So. Um, so normally your heart sinks a bit if, if you know that people are trying to fit too much content into a talk. Um, and so you might have that worry with this particular one. But what I'm not going to do is, is talk in great detail about um, all of the projects that, that I've ever done. Um, and well, I'll tell you in a sec what I will talk about. I've been now at Sussex uh, for 10 years. So I joined in 2011. Um, and so just looking at what was going on in the world in 2011, um, it's the Arab Spring, mostly associated with, with start 2011. Um, Osama bin Laden and Gaddafi were killed. There were riots in London. I was living in London at the time, so that was quite a big thing. Uh, Will and Kate got married and Game of Thrones premiered amongst other things going on in the world. Um, the main thing for me that was going on in the world, other than my move to Sussex, was that my son Adam was born um, a month after I joined Sussex, so in October. Very, very premature, and ended up in hospital for the next eight months in uh, intensive care and sort of trying to get out of uh, UCLH where he was born. So the latter part of 2011 and uh, a lot of 2012, a bit of a blur to me in terms of what was going on outside in the real world. But uh, that's Adam this summer, and he's he's doing very well now. So that's good. Um, so that's the the period that I'm talking about. So from when I joined in 2011 till now, and I mean the idea for this really came about from the last CIS management group meeting, where we were. Um, we often talk about sort of how to, to characterize outputs and what, what research has been generated at CISC. Um, if you look on Calpendo, I think anyone who subscribes on Calpendo, Calpendo can look and see the full list of any project that was registered there. Um, and there's 224 projects currently. Some of them have titles like choose project name. So obviously <laughs> probably not um, projects. But you know there will be a registered um, line for for all of the main studies that that were carried out at CISC. Um, so the question is is what happened to them? And we often don't feed this back, and we don't do it in any kind of comprehensive way. Um, and whether that information ever gets back to everyone at CISC who's been supporting these projects um, is doubtful. So that's kind of the main point of this is to really say. What happened to the ones that I was directly involved in? And to thank everyone at CISC for supporting those projects, um, whatever actually happened to them, um, and to sort of tell people what, what did happen. Uh, so um, in this table, you're not meant to read kind of across the rows. This is just four completely separate columns. Um, so most of the projects, um, I'm talking about 25 projects, I probably should be talking about 26, because I haven't included the colour one that was led by John Maul and Theresa Tang, which I am involved with as well. Um, but I think otherwise it captures pretty much everything that I've been involved in at CISC. Um, so most of these, the vast majority, are ones that we've sort of thought up within our lab. Um, I've also collaborated, um, and I'm listing PIs, and I'm listing the researchers involved uh, later on, uh, with Sophie, Ryan, Anna, um, and Neil Harrison. Um, but yeah, mo most of these things, I end up doing the stuff that from our lab. And the reason why there's so many, well, I guess there's two reasons why there's so many. First is that for a long time, I was a convener of an fMRI module that we ran, 
And for every year that we ran the module, we did a new MRI study and we had students on the course analyze the data from that study. Um, and so there are a bunch of those which we were having to do. So the fMRI module ones, um, we did every year a new, new study um, for that. And also I've been very lucky with getting ERC funding. And so the European Research Council has funded my lab um, and enabled us to do lots of projects. Um, I also funded some from sort of startup fund and devolved money. Um, but at least two of these are tiny, tiny ones. Um, one we gave up on after scanning two people and the other one was um, a, a structural study and kind of um, not a major study otherwise. Um, and then these four other ones, I guess, uh, correspond to these four over here who are from different labs. Um, so that's kind of how the studies came about in terms of funding. Um, they're pretty much equal split between whether the lead researcher was a PhD student at the time or a postdoc at the time. Um, and as I said, two were just very, very small ones. 18 of these studies I'm classifying as sort of normal sized fMRI studies, which in the past sort of meant collecting about 18 people and or 18 sort of usable data sets or even less than that. Um, and is now we're sort of aiming to collect about 30 usable data sets, but basically people come in, do one session and then they go and we analyze the data. Um, for three of them, they were big in the sense that we had two separate sessions. So people would, would come in once, do something for a week and then come back later. Um, and then two of these ones, one which is ongoing and one, um, I'll talk, well, I'll talk about both, um, are huge, massive projects involved in trying to test um, over 100 participants. Um, so that's what they're like. Um, Okay, so what's happened to them? Um, so at the current time of all these projects, um, these ones here, so um, these are published and these we've got preprints for and are trying to get published. So just over half of these have, have been published or sort of hopefully on the way to being. Um, these are, there's exactly a quarter at the moment um, are, unpublished and they're not going to get published so they're they're unlikely to see the light of day in terms of a, a publication um there's some which we're we're currently actively working on and there's some other ones which are ongoing so we're just collecting the data for these ones so i guess what i'm mostly talking about is is kind of um the ones that we did publish and the ones that we didn't um so okay so if we've managed to publish something. Um, then the next graph is showing the length of time it took. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> um, the length of time it took from when it was registered on Calpendo till when we got, I think, an acceptance um, from a journal. Um, and um, I mean, look at that. I'm, I'm pretty pleased. These are the successes, right? These are the ones that are published. Um, to orientate you, so, so Alice DeVish's study um, gets the record for um, coming out within about a year. So this bar is still representing a year's worth of time from first registering it on Calpendo um, to actually having that um, work out and published. Um, that was really, really impressive. It's, that, <laughs> In my mind, that's still going into every study, like, yeah, you can do it in a year, it's fine. Um, but that is very much an exception. Um, most of them have taken, I guess, um, I'm reading this, but, but about sort of three years. Um, some quite a bit longer, and some of which um, we started collecting sort of data back here, and we're still working on to try and get out. So the take home from this is that all of these projects take a long time to to get out um and we won't go into why yet um so uh, what's going to come up here um okay so here's some of the first ones so we're, we're talking um the first studies that we've done this is the earliest so they're 
they're grouped, it should be fairly obvious from sort of when the first one was um, uh, registered on Calpendo going forwards in time. Um, so now I'm going to go through quickly through the studies. So, so I guess the first one we'll talk about a little bit because that was the first one we did for the fMRI module um, was where Sam joined as a, as a um, MSc student to, to help out and do this as part of his project for his MSc. And um, <laughs> it's sort of fair to say that we never quite hit as high again for the rest of the time that I've been at Sussex. This was a good one to start with, um, getting a, a paper out in PNAS um, from that we'd funded through this um, module. Um, but uh, other ones that were done as, as part of the course and for Sam's PhD um, have all been published. Um, including the last one, which Sam did with mostly with Neil Harrison. Um, that was a big study, two session study, and was published earlier this year, last year, um, last year. Um, so has has taken a while, but um, these have all come out and resulted in publications. So we're happy with that. Um, Alice's brilliant prize award winning one came out. Um, that's one of the next ones. Um, Chrissy's first paper um, was published as well as James's. Um, I mean, these ones were fairly painful going through rounds of peer review, um, but this talk's not about that, so I'm not really going to talk about that, but um, they've all come out. So, so far, all of, the, all of these ones that um, uh, we registered on Calpenda, I think, had um, resulted in a, a publication of some sort at some time. Um, ah, yes. So about a year ago, uh, sorry, about this time, but seven years ago, um, Pat emailed around everyone on CISC forum saying that, that uh, Chrissy and I would be presenting our project um, entitled Memory for Events in Adults Referred to Memory Assessment Service Clinics. Um, and so seven years is quite a long time ago. So that's, that's when we were sort of well into, um, thinking about this project. We've still not published this project. So Chrissy um, scanned about a hundred patients and they were all patients, um, coming through this clinic. So it was a massive, massive effort, um, over about two years. She also collected extra data from, from healthy older people. Um, the trouble was really that the, the data that the fMRI data we collected was not anywhere near as clear, clear cut as we thought it was. We thought that in people with very pronounced memory problems, um, there would be some very clear differences when we looked inside the brain while people were, were doing a task that we thought was um, very kind of important and relevant to um, people's memory for their everyday experiences. Um, and it turned out that wasn't the case. And that, that's kind of really, really slowed us up thinking what on earth to, to do with this data set. Um, so we're still preparing it, but actually um, Peter had analyzed some data for part of his PhD um, from the fMRI side and from some of the other um, data that we've got. We are very nearly at the point of being able to put something out, but Chrissy moved on. Um, the data weren't sort of fully analysed, published, and it's it's taken a long time. So I think this is probably like the the longest ongoing study that we still hope to um, get something out from, um, because like we owe it <laughs> to the resources we spent, to the amount of effort that Chrissy put in, and to all of these patients that gave up their time to take part in the study. So we we are. I, I'm being slightly perfectionist about the manuscript because I really want it to be the sort of um, best way of getting across the data that we collected for this study. Um, so it's it's getting there. And I, I mean, if I was if it was to be a year later and this wasn't published, I, I would break down if if that were the case. We're definitely within three months gonna gonna have a public uh, manuscript out. Um, Okay, so some other ones. So um, Gemma did a couple of studies as part of her PhD thesis. Um, neither of these have been or will be published, I think, but both of them 
um, went into her PhD thesis. And so, you know, I tend to think of them as like, oh, that didn't really work. We didn't get anything from that. But actually, um, Gemma has got her, her doctorate. And, um, and they were, so this study, we, we had um, people of female voice, male voice, saying different words that were clustered according to different semantic categories. And the idea was that, that things said by the female voice would tend to sound similar. Um, but if you were saying something like um, uh, chapel or mouse, they're very, very different conceptually. Um, and then we got, is that obscuring that for you as well? Um, uh, also words spoken by a male voice. So then if someone was saying mouse or hamster, they mean something quite similar. So the idea was that we would, by looking at patterns of activity, we would tease apart where in the brain we had sort of speech sounds that were sounding more similar clustering together and then as we went further down a kind of processing stream we'd get to where in the brain meaning was being coded and it was a nice idea for an experiment and we probably didn't collect enough data and we didn't have quite the right stimuli um, and also the researchers a bit gave up on it because it didn't quite show what what we thought it might show um there was certainly a paper that came out that was very very similar and showed similar results to what we'd got um but they'd made more of an effort to publish it than we had uh so hey um and then this other study that Gemma did was also i think a really nice study we were basically trying to, to tease apart episodic memory and semantic memory won't go into details but the problem with this was that we made our task too hard and we'd really tried to control loads and loads of stuff um, and as a result of it people found it incredibly difficult to do the task and once we'd wheedled out the people that weren't performing um, at a level that was kind of meaningful um, we didn't really have enough participants left to, to analyze the data and so had we collected some more data had we designed our task a bit better, we might have got something from it, but we didn't. Um, but hey. um, then, oh yeah, so the next one of um, Sam's is, this is, this is definitely a, a good wine that is aging over time. And we're, we're hoping that having, having got um, nice, but unfortunately a rejection from eLife, we're, we're revising it. Well, Sam's revising, I'm not doing very much at the moment. Um, and this, this, this will have taken quite a long time, I guess, to get from, from inception to, to publication, but it's, it's on its way. Um, this Chris's study came out. So these are ones that were, the year down here is the year where they were sort of logged on Calpendo. Um, so, you know, you're getting things out and about two to three years, that's, that's, that's pretty good for us. <laughs> uh, and then another one of Chrissy's. Um, oh, and then this study that was, was conceived by James Kaidel, um, which unfortunately is one of the ones that won't ever see the light of day, I think. But it introduced me, certainly, to um, the TV shows Dharma and Greg and Mad About You. Um, and these are shows that are unfamiliar to, to most people um, in the UK, certainly our student population. And the idea was that we would familiarize people with one of those two shows over the course of a week. So they really got to kind of know the characters, know how they interacted with each other and stuff. And then we would scan them while they were watching new clips from it or um, looking at, at very, very, very short sort of video clips of the characters. Um, and we'd see how that kind of knowledge built up in a kind of naturalistic way over the course of a week would affect um, how you process this information when you were seeing new things. It was a beautiful design for a study. Um, it didn't work. And uh, I mean, James certainly um, looked at this for, for a long time. It wasn't showing the stuff that he'd hoped it would show. Um, and so it, uh, didn't, didn't see the light of day. Um, but as you will see, it had a second life. Um, and also at this time, I was working with Angela um, and uh, Ryan. So Ryan was supervising Angela's PhD. And um, we did a, a study looking at um, 
uh, sort of resting state connectivity um, in the scanner. And the, the trouble with this is that the a behavioral effect that they'd found outside of the scanner didn't seem to replicate in the scanner. Um, but again, this may was formed a, a important chapter for Angela's PhD thes thesis. Um, so um, then we have, oh God, yes, this one. So, so this was Peter's study that um, is, is probably the most difficult study I've ever had to, to get accepted by a journal. Um, we will plug away at this because it showed some, some nice effects. Um, and it will, I'm sure, see the light of day, but it's slightly annoying that in the time that it's taken us to um, do this study, there's been numerous other ones um, looking at something rather similar. So the kind of importance and novelty of our results have just sunk year by year as other people have published their studies that are rather similar. Um, but it'll get there. Um, so that's a preprint at the moment. Um, and there's Paloma's study, which is um, a study that, again, this is, this is in preparation um, for publication and has formed part of Sophie Forster's um, grant application and also part of Paloma's PhD. Um, but hopefully that will come out soon too. Um, so where are we? 2017, 2018. This is where Dharma and Greg and Mad About You made their comeback because um, having got such a good design and um, we really, really thought that, that this was, was worth revisiting. And so we we changed the design a bit to um, change aspects which perhaps hadn't worked with James's study, um, and so this was part of Peter's PhD, um, and actually got two publications out of it. So so we've we've clawed one back from um, not being able to publish anything from James's study. We got two different publications um, looking at at slightly different tasks in the scanner while people were watching these these people. Um, and oh yeah, and there was also a study which we have just found out sort of a week or so ago is, is now in press at Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, and that was the last study from my ERC um, events grant, uh, Transmem grant. Um, and then the last study that Peter did, so this was the last one we ran as part of the, the fMRI module, I think, um, with me as convener. Um, and Peter looked at, at the study trying to look at, at stereotypes about people, and it didn't really work. So probably honourable mention in Peter's thesis, and may not go anywhere else. And then we have three brand new studies that um, are our first post-COVID studies, part of the um, new grant that we're doing. And so those are data either just finished data collection um, or their ongoing studies. Um, and that brings us up to now. So before I sort of talk about what things worked or didn't work, um, I really wanted to thank everyone at CISC who has made this possible. I'm looking at Vic and Samir in the audience, but also everyone else. And um, I mean, really everyone. So, so, so Stuart being very helpful at, um, on the, the finances side of things um, and all the radiographers of past and present who have helped out. And I'm sure I'm, I'm missing off some um, people, but I hope, I, I hope I've covered um, most of the people that have helped us. Um, because we couldn't have done any of this without without you guys. So it's to pass on our thanks, because normally we thank our, our researchers and our lab in talks, but we don't really thank everyone who supported the study um, from certainly the CIS side of things. So um, there's not very much more of this. Um, I just want to think briefly about sort of what what things have have worked and haven't worked. So I think the fact that I've been able to do lots and lots of studies has um, been helpful. And partly it means that you can try things out. So I mean, really, I'm talking in the context of like having to design a study every year as part of the fMRI module really forces you to just think, right, OK, what should we do this time? Um, because it's 
you know, it's an fMRI scanner. It's a big, big machine. Um, but you're basically just getting a few people to lie in, down in it and collect some data and, and see what happens. And, um, you know, we shouldn't be too scared of doing that. Um, the fact we were having to, to come up with new experiments and we were forced to, to keep on collecting data um, was, was probably a good thing um, because you can overanalyze like whether your task is likely to work or not. And um, so just sort of being put in the situation um, was, was not bad. And, and obviously like the, the um, example of the Mad About You, Dharma and Greg study was, was one where it didn't really work, but we were able to try again and change some things and, and get it to work. And, and I think that was, that was a good thing to, to do. Um, obviously, it sort of goes without saying, but it shouldn't go without saying that that I've had people working with me who are just fantastic, brilliant people who worked really, really hard, um, are very smart, and they've they've put in the effort to get it on out. And obviously, what has worked, and it's possibly you know because of my very privileged position of having funding, is that we had time to work on these projects. So I mean it's helped the fact that Sam was able to do his PhD and be employed as a bit as a postdoc and come back again after three years or so and pick up a study or two studies um, and work on them again. Like, you know, the, the, it was, the, the publications were, were sort of there, but just having the time to work on it, to, to get them out um, was really, really important. And that's obviously not always gonna be the case. Um, but it shows that if you do have that time, it, it can pay dividends. Um, what things didn't work? So um, these are all fairly obvious, but but you still don't really always think about them. So so having effects that you you know work outside the scanner, possibly in nice big groups of people, or because it's a very different environment, that once you bring them into the scanner, they don't work. And and if it's possible to try and use any pilot time or anything to just check whether or not people are going about the task in the same way. Um, that's probably a really good idea. Um, I think not collecting enough data was a big reason for why some of these things didn't work. And we might have thought we, you know, we'd scan sort of 20 odd people. But once we went through who'd moved around too much, whose data we couldn't use because they weren't performing the task at the right level. Um, then we it eroded that away and we were left with with really too small a data set to, to see anything. Um, I think sometimes we'd, we'd sort of decided that there wasn't this kind of super robust effect. Um, so it probably wasn't worth scanning anymore, partly because not um, so much me, but the researchers working with me have been very kind of anxious about spending too much money and that this is a hugely precious resource. And, and if it doesn't look like it's working out all right, we, sh we should just stop and, and not, not waste any more money. And I think that's led to us kind of not collecting enough data for um, some projects where we should have done. Um, arguably, this goes completely against what I said previously, but, but we've taken too long um, analyzing the data and getting these, these publications up. Um, so, Kind of one way of addressing that particular is um, perhaps to pre-register all the analyses for the studies that we want to do. This is a good reason for, for all the reasons why we should pre-register studies, and there's no point going over that because I'm sure people have heard those arguments. Um, it's still kind of surprising when you think, oh, that, that actually really, really applies to, to the studies we're doing. Um, but uh, if you think about it for a bit, it should be fairly obvious that that's the case. Um, but if we're going to, if we start pre-registering things, I have a hope that this might actually save us quite a bit of time um, in the long run, because it, it makes us think and decide really in advance what our processing pipelines should be. Um, and given our hypotheses, given the things that we're most interested in and why we're doing the study in the first place, it's really because we want to find out X, then we think in advance about what we should be doing to test that hypothesis. Um, and also, you know, we can genuinely then say, well, we expected that and we didn't find it. Um, the only trouble with that is that 
in fMRI studies where you are just limited by the number of people that you can scan. I think we're, we're very often going to be in this position where our results are inconclusive. They don't really support one thing, but they don't support the null either. Um, and I think that's, that's just going to be a problem with, with fMRI studies. Um, but, you know, based on sample sizes that are very, very, um, uh, compare very favorably with ones that people generally use, you know, we can say, well, have we managed to support our hypotheses or not? Um, and so, yeah, give us some sort of confidence that, that um, we, we really found the thing we, we set out to look at. Um, but this does rely on having people in a lab who are very, very experienced in fMRI analysis and know all the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches, because you make all of these choices. And in general, how people have learned is they've had a massive data set, they've collected that data set, and then they've sat down and said, right, what do we do? And, um, and they've tried a bunch of things and, you know, they've sort of moved iteratively through and thought, oh, well, it turns out like I was doing that wrong, or I was doing that wrong. Um, and really, you know, part of the reason why these have taken a long time to get published is because people have spent an awful lot of time learning how to analyze data sets in general and that specific data set as well to see like what's, what's the best way to do it. So unless you have people around who can advise on what exactly is the thing that, that you should do, it's going to be very, very difficult to pre-register. So that's kind of what, what I've got here. So, you know, great in, in a lab where we've got expertise already, um, difficult for people without the expertise, and also difficult for people to um, learn while they're analysing. Obviously, you have a data set, you can do all those extra things, but, but um, that's, that's going to swallow up time. Um, so those are kind of where we're thinking about what we should do. And we are, for the three that I've put up, we're, we're trying to pre-register them all in advance and say exactly what we're going to do. Um, and we will see how that goes. Um, and I would like that to be the model going forward, but I'm now aware of issues that I, I didn't really think about beforehand. Um, that is what I wanted to say. I've got, I didn't <laughs> did this at the last minute and scrabbled together some, some photos of our lab. Um, and I could have put some more up as well. But um, thank you, obviously, now to my lab past and present for supporting all of these studies. It's been very fun. That's the end. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Chris? If you are at home, you can just turn on your mic and we'll be able to hear you here. <laughs> if you could, uh, if you could change one thing about CISC and the way it's organised, what would you change or, or build on that group? Um. So. I don't know whether, I suppose part of um, what I was trying to get across, and I sort of didn't do it very clearly at all, was that I think supporting researchers to be able to um, be fairly flexible in how they can use the scan. Well, I don't mean flexible. Um, making it a situation that, that researchers weren't intimidated by the idea of asking, can I come up and try this out? Can we scan um, three people on this task to see whether it's working in the way that we think it is? And, um, you know, are there things that we can, we're, we're not quite sure whether we want to do X or Y, can, can we just try that out? I think, I think that would lead to better designs of people's studies, because I think um, sometimes we can, we can get into the mindset that, um, we have to work this all out and we have to be 100% ready to go um, by the time we start a study. Um, and, you know, if we'd, if we'd actually had the chance to, to play around with some stuff, I mean, we've done this as a, as a lab and it's been very helpful. It's, it's, it has influenced like how we've designed some experiments, whether we've done a sort of localizer with block design or event related design. I think the knowledge that everyone could do that 
um, would be good. And then, you know, as, as with any influence I have over the, the management group, um, you know, I think we should be very strongly supportive of people being able to use scan time to um, boost the numbers if, if, if they'd run out or if it turned out people needed to collect more data. Um, obviously, only when it's free and we're not in, interfering with, with other things. Um, so, yeah, so did you have any thoughts or? There's a pilot, the pilot scanning system. I mean, that, maybe that's been used as like an additional preset of scans. I wonder if maybe that should be more available with just a try things out if it doesn't work. And yeah, we have sort of two different definitions of pilot, and, and yeah. one is the sort of you collect ten people's data um, to stick in a grant application, which is kind of what it's used, and and then there's the way I think of doing a pilot, where where it's like that, that sort of trying out thing, and um, and 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 whether this whole scheme of of being able to just scan ten people is helpful or not is something we've sort of argued about in management meetings. See, Alexa's going. Uh, I'm still using it. I still have the other hand of things. So, so, so if we can do it. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I couldn't hear the previous question, and I think maybe it overlapped with what I wanted to say. So maybe can you tell me what the previous question was, and then I'll. The question I'll... was it was it was Nick asking what do you think CISC could do to um, make things better for researchers? I yeah. I think I was, yeah, I was going to kind of say something related because I was going to say, in a way, just having like one subject would just make a phenomenal difference, you know? Like if you could just test one person on your design, you would be able to run, like you'd be able to basically just figure out your analysis enough to pre register in most cases, I think. So maybe we could just be very um, generous with just letting people scan one person if they're planning on doing a pre registration, you know? um does does that make sense it totally makes sense i mean obviously <laughs> i'm not in a position to say that but um... yeah i just it's like as a proposed i guess the thing is you know if everybody's doing it and they're just there's been a hundred one subject scan on different studies and no nothing gets pre-registered it could stop but i think in general people would if they're going to invest the time in doing a whole analysis just on one subject they're quite likely to follow through and actually do the study because yeah 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 yeah, Alexa saying maybe one to four, but yeah, that's that's. I I mean I can I can certainly as part of my my position on the CIS management group um, pass pass on any comments that come up from this discussion here. I'm <laughs> I'm avoiding Samira's cases. The idea that we all have millions of, of studies where we scan one person and yeah, you have like set up like yeah. the entire procedure. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, we, we request a pilot where we say, could we do it as part of physics development time and stuff, but uh, I don't suppose anyone else, and certainly in psychology, knows that you can do that. So, um, yeah. Uh, Alexa? You might, maybe you want to ask Stuart to come back first, because I suspect he might be addressing the, the points just raised. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Hi, I, I don't think this is a problem personally, asking for, in principle, for pre-registration development time. I can't see why we wouldn't be supportive of that in principle. I mean, I think we need to sit down and perhaps just talk it through a little bit more, perhaps with Chris, Sophie, Alexa, whoever. But we, we try to have a very broad definition of pilot developmental time. And if if, by having one subject you can make really, or even up to four participants as pilots can really get your project designed properly and worked out. That's for me, is exactly what it's there for. So I don't know whether that helps or not. I'm getting a thumbs up for Chris, which is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Big thumbs up for, for that, Stuart. Um, yeah, I was partly working out where the camera was as well. 
Yeah, I got it. <laughs> uh, was then a Lex. Hey, uh, hi, Chris. Thanks very much for raising all these issues. So these are just sort of, it's, yeah, things that that definitely apply to to our work in MindApp as well, and even more so because of our lack of large amounts of funding. And I'd also add that one of the things I find super helpful to, to, to get work done and get new projects started and 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 feed into grant applications, even if they're not always successful, is is bit for PhD students being able to scan. Um, and obviously that means sort of costs need to be reasonable and you know i know that there's been some changes about that recently but the more that from my point of view the more that sys can do to support phd student scanning both for training for the students themselves and and for the groups that that they're part of the better um so that was one thing and then i just wanted to make a kind of also supportive of pre-registration so we've just started doing that in my lab and we had our first paper published this year um, in uh, not that we're supposed to be focusing on which journals we get things into but in journal of neuroscience with my uh, PhD student from Edinburgh and the, we did have a smoother ride we really did I mean the things that the, the things that we did that the reviewers might have done a different way there was a substantial lot of analysis that one reviewer wanted us to do that we didn't do because we said we pre-registered this and there's really no reason to favor your approach and and that was fine and yeah i just felt it was I, I felt it really helped it helped for all the reasons chris said and the practical reasons to do with the, the, the process of peer review cool oh, thank you very much um, i think i don't think there's any more questions um so um yeah i'd just like to say that this is the so first of all, thank you, Chris, for this uh, fantastic talk and really useful discussion. Um, this is the last CNI talk of the year, um, and if people could please let me know if they have any uh, talks for next year. I've only got currently two project proposals for next year, so uh, please come forward and we'll. we'll, we'll see oh, and and do do sign up for the Sussex Neuroscience Christmas party, which tickets are. Tickets are available from me, actually. Oh, oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, send me an email or come and see me in my office. Like I'm, I'm selling some tickets for that. Cool. And thanks, people, for for adding to the discussion online. Thank you for that. Cool. Thank you again. Should I sign out here? Yes, please.